uh, as I hear those words in, as our team was singing it, right now in this week, it, it kind of feels heavy, um, this prayer for God's presence. And um, especially what's going on in Texas in our own country right now, um, the stories that are that are hearing. I don't know about you, but a lot of our team, uh, we are texting back and forth with people who have family members who are down in Texas. The weight that they're carrying, the loss that they feel, the disappointment, the hurt, uh, it's overwhelming. And even right now, uh, they say about 14 million people will have to boil water at this point, maybe more. And hundreds of thousands uh, of people lost power. And um, as I was reaching out to friends... It was this overwhelming desire for God's presence, for God's comfort, um, for, for his ability to step in in these moments. And so would you join me and pray as, as we um, think about our brothers and sisters um, who are navigating so much right now? Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your grace and your presence. Uh, we ask for it right now. We ask for it in the middle of pain, in the middle of loss the middle of disappointment. Lord, we pray for the, the community of Texas, state of Texas, as they're navigating so many different things, the families, the businesses. We pray that you'd be with them and uh, you'd bring resources and you'd allow this situation to, uh, um, that you would bring your presence into it to help people navigate um, their next steps. We pray, Lord, that you would allow us to be open um, to receiving whatever it is that you're calling us to do in this moment. In your name, amen. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do as a team, we were talking, um, one of our passions here at Kensington is this idea of moving out, to be mobilized into the world and into the community, to respond to moments. And so many of you that maybe have been a part of Kensington for a while, you know about our move out teams. There are these teams of volunteers and, and partnerships that have been established where our team members just go. They move out into the community. And one of our move out teams that we have um, been with over the last uh, couple of years is this move out team called Draw. And they're a disaster relief network, and we've been in partnership with them uh, this past year during the Midland situation, but in many more. And so our draw move out team actually is being mobilized. We are uh, reaching out to their executive director, this guy, Greg, who is on his way down to Texas with a team with supplies for clean water. And so uh, we are on the phone with them asking, how can we connect with you? How can we support? And so right now, uh, we want to give an opportunity to our community to respond financially in partnership with bringing clean water to Texas, uh, knowing that that is one of the dire situations that are happening right now. Uh, so our draw team is uh, partnering with uh, World Vision going, how do we get resources down there? And so um, there are a couple different ways that you can give. You can give on our app, which is our easiest way to do that. You can give on our website or uh, you can text Kensington Special to the number 77977 and follow the prompts. 100% of those uh, gifts will be uh, donated to that community so that we can uh, partner with them for water. And I just want to say thank you for your generosity and partnership uh, for moving out with us into the world and responding in these moments. So as we kind of step into today's service, uh, I want to just kind of give us a, a few of the things that are happening in our local community. What are the ways that we are engaging in our world, in our community right now? A few of the events that we have available for our community. One, our Bowers Farm event, which is happening next week, uh, next week, Sunday. Now the Sledding Hill, the Tubing Hill, uh, all of those spots are booked, but we're inviting people to just join us around the fire, grab some food, hang out, connect uh, outside. Um, maybe for some of you, this has been a season of isolation, and this is an opportunity to connect with some of our community and engage with one another in person. Maybe for some of you, uh, you don't feel comfortable with that, and that's totally fine. Uh, we just want to invite people to, to engage with one another, to encourage one another, and have a little fun together in this season. Uh, another thing that is happening at the beginning of March is the IF gathering. It's this gathering women's conference that is available to all of our Kensington women. We partnered with them to create an opportunity for people to engage and uh, to be able to uh, find a time of encouragement, to watch together, to have watch parties uh, in their own homes, to, to uh, be texting one another about what they're learning and growing in. But that's available for you on the website. You can do that to sign up for, for that event, and it would be a really incredible encouragement. 
Now, Josh and I uh, and a few others were talking about this with our team about in this season, it's been so interesting uh, as we haven't been able to be physically together to kind of run into one another to celebrate what God has maybe been doing or ask for a prayer for the, the points of disappointment and frustration that we've been experiencing. And so one of the things that we uh, talked about doing is we, we wanted to just share more stories, to take moments, whether in a service, whether um, on our social media page, just ways to share stories of ways that God is moving in this season. Because sometimes we can have a perspective that because we aren't hearing those stories as often or in the ways we used to, we miss out on what God is doing in the middle of this season. And so one story that was just shared with our team that was really beautiful was there was a woman who jumped into one of our groups this about five weeks ago, and she was sharing some of her story with the community, this new community that she has started to walk with. And she shared about how she had grown up around the church and, and kind of had the duty of going to church church and engaging in church, but it wasn't really something that she felt there was a personal relationship, a, a connection, a, a desire for more. And so, you know, that kind of fell away as she grew older and as she became a mom and a wife and, and all the different things that happened in life. And she was sharing with um, this group of women five weeks into a conversation where she jumped in this uh, five weeks ago and she, she was sharing how there was something stirring inside of her heart that she couldn't quite understand, but she knew it was, it was this idea that God was more personal than she ever knew, that God was more available to her, that God was actually cared about her and what was going on in her life. And she decided to buy her first Bible. And uh, she was describing this moment of like this overwhelmed excitement, uh, this nervousness to open up the stories of Jesus and discover what he is like and that there was something for her in that. And I, one of the, the people in the group just said they just brought tears to their eyes to see such passion for something that sometimes we take for granted. But this is the story of our people. We are on this journey, all of us, at different spots. And God is kind of stepping into that with us, engaging our hearts. And maybe for you and me, it's this moment where it, it, it kind of has us take a step back and go, God, what are you doing in my heart? Like when you hear a story like that, you're, God, what are you doing in me? What, are you, what is it that you're stirring in my heart? Just like you're stirring something new in her heart. And maybe this song that our, our team is leading us in is this idea of our need for God. And maybe you've been in a season where you have felt like you've been avoiding him, or you kind of just kind of pushed him off to the side. And this song is a prayer. It's a hope of saying, God, I need you. I need your presence. I need your love. I need your grace. And maybe this song is a moment of singing back to him, or it's maybe a song of reflection and prayer and saying, God, would these words become my words? Would you reveal your presence and your hope and your love for me? Would you remind me of the journey that you are inviting all of us on so that we can experience your presence?
come to you now with open hearts and we ask you to enter in. God, may our hearts long for you and burn for you, Jesus. As we see the world the way that you see the world, let us point ourselves back to you. As we see our circle the way that you do, our neighbors, our family, our friends, the way that you see them. God, may you fill our hearts with a compassion that can only come from you. God, I pray now that as we open up your word, that you would reveal more of yourself to us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh and Esther and the team. So thankful for all of you. You know, uh, this series is, it, I've been so excited about it. There's something so powerful, uh, I believe, as we lean into these moments where Jesus' full humanity is on display. And that's why we called this series Personified, is we wanted to step into this idea that, that in Jesus' humanity, he offers us something so powerful, hope, perspective, uh, grace, truth. And, and in that, we, when we look at these moments as how, where Jesus was described, uh, one of those is in Hebrews 2, verse 17. And here's what it said. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted and he was able to help those who are being tempted. It's this idea that in Jesus's humanity, he connects with our story. Like our stories are completely intertwined. There's something so powerful when we take a moment and a step back and kind of realize that, that what could Jesus be teaching us in his humanity and how could that stir our hearts for greater things? And so that's, that's my hope of this series. And as we take another step with him today, now my family, uh, we're, we're unique. Uh, I'm sure it is every family is, but my mom immigrated here from Taiwan. Uh, her family fled uh, from China. An incredible story that I'm sure uh, I'll tell someday. But um, so they fled from China to Taiwan, restarted their lives over in the slums with nothing. And so my mom ended up immigrating here after, after college. And, and so my family is all around the world. Uh, my sister lives in China now. Um, my other sister lives down in Florida. Like we are all over the world. My aunts and uncles live everywhere, right? And so so because of that, our family reunions don't happen every year, but our family reunions are often a little bit unique. And one of the ones that we did a couple years back is we decided we would meet up in Australia, just you know, a, a short trip away. And so we're getting excited. The expectation of this trip um, with our kids, we had three kids at the time, uh, we're, it's building. Our kids are asking for the countdowns, and countdowns are a big deal in our family, right? They bring up this expectation, and so we're, you know, we're doing all the things, taking care of the logistics, and, and, and it was a little bit interesting. There were a lot of flights to do this, all the things we needed to have, all the snacks to be able to function with three children, and the car seats. It was overwhelming the, uh, just to plan this trip, but one of the things that happened was about 24 hours before we are about to leave, some, there was this moment, this feeling just came over me, and I looked down at our tickets because you know I'm going through my checklist and I look at my wife's ticket and I had made an incredibly terrible mistake instead of writing Jennifer I did the autofill button when we filled out the tickets and I wrote Jenny now there are a few different things if you've ever traveled having a nickname instead of the real name is an absolute no-no when it comes to your passport and connecting it and there are a few loopholes around it unfortunately none of the loopholes would work for 13 hours I was on a phone call 
asking people for, for grace, asking people for mercy, and the disappointment was mounting. Emotionally, I was entirely spent. My time had been lost. My battery powder, I had to keep charged, and you know, the phone charged all day long so I could make every one of these phone calls. It was terrible. Logistically, disappointed. Financially, I ended up having to buy seven one-way tickets, knowing I would have to negotiate on every single plane flight to get my wife to be able to sit next to me. Now, I figured I had a pretty good offer. I had three young children that nobody wants to sit by, so there was a little bit of, of power that I had, but eventually, all of it ended up not being great, right? The logistics also in this moment. Like some of you, just imagine one of the logistical decisions we had to make is Jenny had to leave me and the three children one day early to fly to another country to make a connecting flight the next day so that we could be together. I have never felt so disappointed in myself. I look at looking at my wife. I felt like there was shame that was just coming over me. I don't know how you deal with disappointment. I don't do well with it. It's a whole mix of emotions. Bitterness increases. Uh, my frustration increases. The self -neg negative talk increases. And Brene Brown actually, who studies shame, said this about, um, about shame. Think about this. Secrecy, silence, judgment. Those are three things shame needs to grow exponentially in our lives. When we come face to face with disappointing moments, shame, often the shame cycle begins to take over. Whether we've been disappointed in somebody else or disappointed in ourselves. But she was asked this next question. What is the antidote? She said this, the antidote is empathy. Shame cannot survive being spoken and being met with empathy. It's this moment where our hearts are engaged and connected. It's this moment where when we experience empathy, we are seen, we are valued, we are recognized, and our pain is, is maybe not said it was okay, but, but somebody is present with us. I believe when Jesus steps in in his humanity, he is showing us a type of empathy that's otherworldly, that is beautiful, that is an invitation for us to journey with him. Because we know this, that there is a pit that we experience in shame. But I believe that Jesus models for us an example of how to take the ladder out of the pit of shame towards restoration, towards hope, towards relationships, and experience a different future. While we live in a world that we will always face disappointments, we have a model in Jesus of how to move forward. It may not always be the journey we want, but I believe it's the journey we need, and we see that happen in this moment. So before we, we jump in further, I want to take a moment and receive our offering. Uh, this is a moment in our service where we are engaging with one another, where we're, where we're saying we are a part, partnership together to experience God's goodness in our community, to experience transformation, to experience hopefulness, to experience uh, God's peace going out into the world. When we partner together financially, whether you give on the app, the website, tax, however you are giving, however you are partnering with us, you are partnering with stories. You are partnering with a very powerful movement that impact is happening like we shared earlier in ways that we get to share together and in ways that we don't quite know yet but that we are a part of. So thank you for your generosity. If you're new and you have just started joining us, uh, I just want to say thank you for, for trusting us and leaning in with us and maybe God is doing something else in your heart so that you can experience his hopefulness in this season. So we're going to start with this question uh, right now. We're going to start with this idea that we're going to talk about throughout the whole series. This idea of how is, does Jesus' humanity shape my humanity? It's this question I want you to live in. Every single story we see, we ask this question of how is that shaping my humanity? Last week we looked at how God's view of beauty instills in us a desire to fight for beauty, to experience beauty, to inspire others to fight for beauty. Well, today we're going to look at this moment where Jesus disappointed people. Now, that may be a shocking statement to you, but in this story, you will see how he disappointed people in this moment that we often call the, the Palm Sunday triumphal entry experience. Now, we're doing this a little bit earlier than the normal Palm Sunday. Part of the reason why is because we're on this journey with Jesus to the cross, and we're experiencing it together, and so we want to lean into this moment. But one of the things that happens here is people had expectations for Jesus all the time. Everywhere he went, they had expectations of what he would do. They had expectations of how he would talk, expectations of what he would say and how he'd treat people. And sometimes 
depending on the people, their expectations won't fulf- weren't fulfilled. And in this moment, as we step into the chapter of, of Matthew chapter 21, and we look at the story, there is this context around what's happening in this community. See, the, the P- Jewish people at that time, they had heard stories about a Messiah, somebody who was coming, someone who had authority and power, somebody who would bring this liberation to their lives. And so people had heard these stories as young boys and girls hearing the stories and their families being told. And so all of a sudden they had this expectation that would arise in them of what God might be doing. And they were always looking for, is this the one? Is this the Messiah? Is this the person who is going to liberate us, to offer us freedom? And so we look at what happens as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem in Matthew 21. It says this, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them, uh, uh, went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Now, there's this really significant moment that is happening that we might be overlooking so quick. This moment where people started laying these palm branches on the ground was this moment to say there is victory coming. It's this symbol that something significant was about to happen. And Jesus was walking in a future victory. It was this belief that expectation is rising that he would be triumphant he would bring their peace and hope that they long for hosanna meaning to save like praise to the one who saved now there's this part of of scripture that's kind of like these uh, the different scriptures in the old testament that would talk about the messiah these messianic scriptures that and they talk about the messiah and the way that he would come and the way he would do and and what these people are saying as they're shouting in excitement is that hosanna this is the one like he's coming to save he's the one who has the authority He is anointed because they see him on a donkey, on a colt. As he rolled, rode in, they knew the scripture from the Old Testament. They knew the scripture that would talk about this future Messiah who would liberate them. It was from Zechariah 9. It says, rejoice greatly, dear Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. It will take away the chariots of Ephraim, the war horses of Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations, and his rule will extend from sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. This moment that is happening that they're watching is also happening at a very significant time. It's at the beginning of the Passover week. Now, Passover is this celebration in the Jewish culture where they celebrate when God liberated the Jewish people from Egypt, when they were in bondage, when they were in slavery, when they were under the rule of another government and they didn't have the ability uh, to, to go and move. And it was this moment where God liberated them. And so they celebrate this every single year, this Passover celebration. So Jesus is walking in to Jerusalem with palm branches on a donkey, kind of fulfilling some of these significant boxes that people would check, power, authority, a royal treatment. And you can feel the expectations rising. You can can hear the shouts, believing that this is the moment that we have been waiting for. This is the moment where a new king would bring a new kingdom and we would be liberated like we were before. We would be liberated in this world. But Jesus, he had an entirely different perspective. He actually had an entirely different purpose. Jesus knew what they wanted wasn't what they needed. He knew what they wanted wasn't what they needed. I don't know about you, but you know, I have four kids. And so there are a lot of wants that get thrown out around the house. A lot of desires in our family. If I was to kind of sum up the three wants that my children want, they want video time, 
They want cheesy snacks, especially, and they want dessert. Like they want treats. So it's treats, snacks, and, and video time. And they find all the different ways to tell me that's what they need even though that's what they want. Like my daughters will totally play into my heart. They're like, dad, can we go to donut cutter because it's a tradition and we need to to have our family traditions. Dad, can we bake brownies and cookies together because we want to make memories, right? They're not saying we want to bake vegetables together, grill those up. No, we want to bake cookies and brownies and then you can take pictures, dad. You can take pictures of this moment. These are the expectations of what we need. Dad, if we do a movie night, you can even pick what we watch, right? Like they are playing into my heart, but I have a different perspective. Well, I know that that's what they want and that's all they want. I know as a father who loves them and has a different perspective for their life, I know what they need over what they want. Jesus knew that they wanted an earthly king to kind of take away the earthly frustrations that they had. But Jesus knew what they needed was a heavenly king to take on the heavenly kingdom to bring hope and restoration to their hearts, not to their circumstances, but to their hearts that the, the community of Israel didn't need more power For them to experience liberation, what they needed is to know where true power comes from and to know where true liberation exists in our hearts, in our minds, and in the burdens that we carry. And that it would come through their own community in the person of Jesus. Here's kind of this critical moment when we think about what it means when either we're disappointed or we disappoint people and we see this in this moment of Jesus. It's this moment that I believe allows us to step in to the foreseeable moments of disappointment that we will experience. Jesus's purpose was different than people's expectations. Jesus was not committed to people's expectations to fulfill them. No, no, he kept a purpose, a perspective that was far greater, far more hopeful, far more loving. Imagine the dilemma that Jesus has in this moment as he is, he's on this coal uh, walking in and he hears the crowds and he sees the moment happening and he knows what they're expecting, but he knows the purpose of his week ahead. He knows the desires of his week ahead. He knows what he is actually bringing for the liberation and freedom of their hearts. And then he sees his disciples who are probably like, this is the moment. This is, this is why we followed you for three years. And he knows what's coming. The doubts with disappointment, the frustrations, the wondering, did I waste my time because Jesus didn't fulfill the expectations that I had. Why is Jesus able to do this? Why? Jesus knew his purpose. He knew his identity and therefore he was able to step into his future with conviction in the midst of people's expectations and potential disappointment. We go back even to the very beginning of Jesus's ministry. The moment that he began his ministry was a moment where his identity was defined that would inform his future. And it's out of Matthew verse chapter three, verse 17. It's this moment when Jesus was baptized and as he comes out of the water before he's done anything worth truly celebrating in the world that with the next three, two to three years would unfold and happen. All the stories that kind of we have says this, behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus's identity was not in his, the things that he needed to do to please people. Instead, Jesus's identity was in the person that he was truly pleasing his father in heaven. And the idea that his purpose, his perspective, the future that he longed for, for people 
was far greater than their expectations. I was talking with a friend this week about moments where we disappoint or moments we've experienced disappointment. It's so interesting what we do in those moments. Like, have you ever noticed that in those moments, what you do is you often judge others by their actions, but you judge yourself by your intentions? Like when I'm in a moment where I've disappointed somebody, I'm thinking, you know what? If you only knew my side, if you only knew my perspective, if you only knew what I was thinking, but then when somebody else does something that disappoints us or frustrates us, like, well, you should have known, you should have done. And we allow this judgment to kind of go on them and and we give ourselves grace. It's this interesting tension that we deal with when it comes to disappointment. And we do the same thing to God. Like, God, you didn't deliver. You didn't deliver in the way that I thought you were going to deliver. As as I was thinking about this and talking about it with Jenny, there's a lot of disappointments that I've experienced in my life. A lot of moments, especially in relationship, whether somebody hurt me or I hurt somebody, there, there are these disappointments. But one of them that I remember feeling really disappointed about God and really frustrated and almost like where doubts increased was this, was in my senior year of college. See, I, uh, at the beginning of my senior year, uh, I got a job offer and accepted a job in the fall of my senior year. So I had a job all the way through winter, all the way through spring. Like I just knew I had to graduate. And then in in the early fall of of that year, I would have my job and walk into it. And what was amazing about the job I had, it was this incredible leadership program that I got to be a part of. I got to travel. I got to experience all different types of, of businesses and environments. And even in the spring, I was actually being flown around to different, uh, different places and interacting with different people on the team. And it was this really cool moment. I was like, this is what I'm excited about. And then all of a sudden it started to crumble. The expectations that I had, the things that were said to me in the interview process or in my offer letter began to shift and change. And all of a sudden the job I was promised didn't actually start to pan out in the way that it was offered to the point where it crumbled and no longer was I going to join that company or be a part of that because I didn't know what I was getting into. So here I am, a graduate of college with a degree, and I have no commitment for a job. I have to walk away for something saying, I don't need this, yet I want to be employed. And I have an impending rent cost coming. I have commitments that I've made and I'm feeling the weight of disappointment. And I remember when I, when I had that phone call at the coffee shop that I was at that day, sitting outside and just wondering, God, what are you doing? How did you let me end up here? Like, where were you? And as that moment began to unfold and the journey from that moment, I kind of take a step back and I go, was it my wants or my needs? that I was disappointed about. Like, I I know I have needs, but was it really my needs? And all of a sudden, as I was processing through that this week, I started realizing, what would I have missed out on if it wasn't for that disappointment? You know, Jenny and I even talked about this. Would we have been at the midweek service back in 2007, where Steve Andrews and I had a conversation and Jenny about a stirring in our hearts to walk away from our jobs that we ended up having and step into a different role? Would I have missed out on the stories? Would I have missed out on the community? Would I missed out on being able to see people's lives transformed in the way I would have been because I would have been in a different city. I would have been in a different role. Like sometimes what I realize when we take a step back and we, we go, God, what is your perspective? We begin to see a more holistic picture of the world and maybe the disappointments and trials that we face are really because we have boxed in God to a certain set of expectations because I believe this that while disappointments hurt a better perspective brings healing and in our moments of disappointment or moments of being disappointed we will wrestle with that we will wrestle with the why it's good I believe it's really good for us to wrestle with the why, but maybe one of the questions we start wrestling with is we ask God, why? What is it that you are doing in this moment? Where have I 
missed what you are doing? Where have I placed expectations on you? Like, imagine this. When I started wrestling with my expectations, I realized this, that I've kind of contained God naturally into a box. And this is where the majority of my disappointments come. There is this box of expectations, how God should show up in this moment, how God should move in on my behalf, how God should, should act in this situation. And I box them in. I say, God, will you meet me in my box so that the life that I'm planning for, the life that I'm hoping for, that would be fulfilled. And when I look at that and I think about that, you know, God doesn't live in a box of our expectations. That is not what he is limited to because our box of expectations don't compare to God's boundless purpose and boundless potential for our lives. God is not limited to this box, but he offers us something so much greater. He actually fulfills the needs of our heart if we allow him. If we push aside the box and we wrestle with where we have kind of limited God and go, God, what is it that you are doing? Because we will disappoint. But one of the truths that I learned when I step outside of that that box of expectations, I can often think because I disappointed, I am a disappointment. That is not what God is saying. God is saying, even though we will disappoint, we are not a disappointment in his eyes. Even though we will make mistakes and people will make mistakes, we are not a mistake. Even though we will not meet expectations, God still accepts us as his sons and daughters and invites us to experience that boundless potential, that boundless grace, that boundless peace that he offers to our hearts. And maybe God is trying to stir some truth inside of us, the boundless amounts of truth that he offers in his promises in his actions and in his intentions. See, Jesus shows us that on the journey to the cross, he was willing to disappoint people's expectations for their eventual restoration. Jesus was willing to disappoint people so that people would experience the hope that he actually knew would liberate them. Jesus was willing to say no to some people, to say yes to all people experiencing his hope and his grace. Say no to this box of expectations to say, this is where my boundless grace and hope resides. Jesus says yes to reconciliation. Jesus says yes to grace. Jesus says yes to hope. Jesus says yes to peace. Jesus says yes to peacemaking. Jesus says yes to being in relationship with us and walking with us, giving his presence to us so that we can experience freedom and liberation in our souls, in our minds, in our hearts, in our relationship with others, but also, and even more importantly, our relationship with him. And just like if we want to lean into how Jesus modeled his life, where he said yes to something significant, a perspective that was more powerful and beautiful and more transformative to the world. When we say yes to what Jesus is inviting us into, we end up saying no to some things along the way. And we do this all the time. We say yes to going to the gym early in the morning to be healthy, we say no to an extra hour of sleep or an extra show. When we say yes to sobriety, we say no to circumstances that may compromise us. When we say yes to purpose, we say no to things that keep us comfortable. When we say yes to serving, to partnering with the organizations that we, we get to be a part of, we say yes to telling better stories to our children and saying no to saying we're just here for us. When we choose to say yes to Jesus, and his purpose and his plans, we also ask him what to say no to. Why can we do this? Just like Jesus, Jesus knew where his identity was. He knew where his purpose lies and he knew who he was pleasing. I love what Galatians 1.10 says. It's one of my life verses. Am I pleasing people or am I pleasing God? It's a very simple question. And it's the invitation for us to seek out God's desires over people's expectations and desires. When we do, we get to discover a boundless grace and hope. 
a hope that is unending, a peace that transcends circumstances, and an ability to walk through the disappointments of life, to ask for grace when we make a mistake, and to see truth when we're asking the question why. See, we cling to the promises of God, the promise. And this is what the scriptures kind of reveal to us over and over again through the Old Testament and the New Testament, the promises of God. Here are a few of God's promises that are found in the stories of scripture, why we continue to go back to them. The promise of his strength, the promise of his courage, the promise of his provision, the promise of his faithfulness, the promise of his help, the promise of his guidance, the promise that God's presence far outweighs our disappointments and that he is boundless and he offers a relationship in this journey of life with us that not only speaks to our needs, meets our needs, but offers us purpose and potential to walk with him into the future and invite others to do the same. When we say yes to Jesus, we are able to lean into his promises over the lies that want to pull us away. So how do we start? I want to close here with just four questions, four prompts for you this week. Because I think one of the most important things when it comes to navigating the disappointments in life is that we have to do some heart work. We have to do some work internally and go, God, what is it that you're doing in me? What is it that you're trying to speak to me? What is it that you offer me? In this season. So here are the questions. The first one is this. How is Jesus' humanity shaping my humanity? I think it's one of the most important questions we're going to ask. And maybe the question kind of leads us to, I maybe need to know more about his humanity. Stay with us in this series. But also, maybe it's a moment, it's what I find myself doing often, to kind of spend time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These, these scriptures that follow the narrative of Jesus' life, how he interacts with people, how he chooses empathy in people's situations. The second question is what do we need to say yes to? What is it that God is inviting us to say yes to? Is it more purpose? Is it something significant? Is it into a moment to have greater empathy where we're frustrated with people? Is it forgiveness? Is God inviting us to say yes to something that would break our hearts for what breaks his? Is God asking us to say yes to something significant so that we can walk into the world differently? Is God asking us to say yes to being with him and experiencing his promise, to believe that his promises are true? The third one is, what do we need to say no to? Every time we say yes to something, we have to say no to something else. It's a choice. And so if we're going to say yes to time with God, if we're going to say yes to reading the scriptures, if we're going to say yes to leaning into his voice, it may mean we have to say no to have the discipline to say, this is not good for me right now. And even if that causes a disappointment to know that we are clinging to our identity found in Jesus over our identity found in pleasing people. And the last question is this, are you saying yes to Jesus? We could say yes to a lot of things in our world, but are we saying yes to Jesus who offers us peace that transcends, hope that is unending, boundless grace and truth? Are we saying yes to Jesus when he invites us into a relationship with him? Are we saying yes into Jesus when we have been following him for a while and he's saying, I want to work on this area of your heart? Are we saying yes to when he prompts us? Are we saying yes to Jesus over pleasing people? Are we saying yes to Jesus to difficult conversations? Are we saying yes to Jesus to not only saying yes to Jesus himself, but saying yes to his view of humanity and his invitation to us to follow him into this world, to love people, to serve people, to honor people. This is where Jesus models for us something so powerful, where he knows our wants, but he truly knows what we need. And he says, this is the invitation I offer to you. My hope is that this week, you would take some time to process through these questions and let God stir your hearts and see where he leads you. Because I believe 
that as we take a step back in our perspective, we get to see what God is doing in this world through his people and through our community. And it is one of the most powerful yeses we can say. Heavenly Father, thank you for saying yes to us to knowing that our expectations pale into comparison to your boundless grace and offer of hope for our humanity. Thank you for showing us how you live and how you love and how you engage with people and that you meet us in our disappointment and that you offer us a way out of the cycle of shame and you are empathetic in the way that you engage with us. Thank you that you are a father like that, God, that you love your children that way and that you offer us a different future. Would you allow us to pause and hear you speaking to us? Give us the strength to say yes to the things that you're inviting us into and to say no to the things that you're calling us away from. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say thank you for being here with us today. And my hope is that, that whatever God is stirring in you, that you would share with somebody, that you would share with a spouse, that you would share with a small group, that you would share with somebody close in your community saying, this is what God is doing in my heart. And I'm not even sure if I fully believe him, but that you would be in relationship with others as we do. So we're, next week, we're going to continue this series, Personified. I am incredibly excited to say that we have Dr. Eric Moore with us, leading us into this next moment of Jesus' humanity being revealed in a way that shapes us. It's going to be an incredible week. Would love to have you sign up for the Bowers Farm event or join for those of you women that want to join the IF conference. It's going to be incredible. Go sign up online. Uh, look forward to seeing you. God bless you. And have a great week.